Hello, everyone. My name is Annie Haddad, and I am the historian at the Merchant's House Museum. It is my great pleasure in honor of Women's History Month to welcome you to our new series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. In this series of short stories, we will explore how women writers of this period give voice to the pressing issues that were facing women by pulling back the curtains that shrouded their lives to reveal the harsh realities of life in the home and in American society. Defying convention by invading the traditional masculine domain of literature, these writers use their narratives to lay bare the pervasive marginalization of women who were restricted by what was called the cult of true womanhood, of which the prized virtues were piety, submissiveness, domesticity, and purity. They also boldly raised questions about racism and prejudice within the society. While being told to suffer in silence and given constant reminders of their imposed inferiority, many women felt trapped and unfulfilled and hungered for recognition of their plight. As a result, these female writers were critical and commercial successes, despite the largely dismissive attitude of writers and critics. For example, in 1855, a resentful Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote to his publisher, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women, and I should have no chance of success while the public is occupied with their trash. Many of these innovative feminist themed stories appeared in the popular periodicals of the day, such as Godey's Ladies Book, Peterson's, and the Atlantic Monthly, and in popular gift books and literary annuals, where they were probably read by the Treadwell women who occupied the home on 4th Street that today we know as the Merchant's House Museum. Since the letters in the museum archives provide little information about the inner lives of Eliza Treadwell and her six daughters, we may read these stories and wonder whether or not they shared the experiences and thoughts expressed within them. Now, after being largely excluded from the American literary canon for a large part of the 20th century, the rise of women's studies programs and attention to feminist literature led to a renewed appreciation of these authors and their works. The renowned literary and feminist scholar, Elaine Showalter, edited two of the anthologies from which my story selection was taken. I am thrilled to inform you that on April 8th, Dr. Showalter, Professor Emeritus of Princeton University, will be joining us for a virtual discussion and Q&A. Dr. Showalter has written extensively on the short story form as a tool by which women writers could express the circumstances of women's lives. Her expert insights will surely enliven our discussion, so I do hope you join us for that event. Now, you probably have not heard of most of the writers in this series. In that case, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to them. Before we begin our first story, I would like to recite one stanza of a poem by Anne Bradstreet titled Prologue. Considered to be one of the most important early American poets, Bradstreet was the first writer to be published in the North American colonies. A mother of eight, she wrote many poems that addressed her domesticity, her Puritan faith, and her struggles to remain committed to her writing despite the confining role she was assigned to by virtue of her sex. 
In prologue written in 1650, Bradstreet reflects with a mixture of anger and sarcasm on how society rejects the idea that a woman may have creative impulses. I am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a needle better fits. A poet's pen all scorn I should thus wrong. For such despite they cast on female wits. If I do prove well, it won't advance. They'll say it's stolen or else it was by chance. Now on to our story, The Angel Over the Right Shoulder by Elizabeth Stewart Phelps. Born in 1815 in Andover, Massachusetts, Phelps did not achieve literary success until late in her life with the publication in 1851 of her enormously successful novel, The Sunny Side or The Country Minister's Wife. She also wrote a series of stories for girls, making her one of the first authors to write in this genre. In her popular story, The Angel Over the Right Shoulder, published in 1852, which was the year of Phelps's death, she captures so perfectly the struggles of a creative woman as she attempts to balance her artistic ambitions with her domestic burdens of wife and mother. Phelps's only daughter, feminist writer Elizabeth Stewart Phelps Ward, wrote of her mother's trials in her autobiography. The struggle killed her, but she fought till she fell. There, a woman's work is never done, said Mrs. James. I thought for once I was through, but just look at that lamp. It will not burn and I must go and spend half an hour over it. <laughs> Don't you wish you had never been married? said Mr. James with a good natured laugh. Yes, rose to her lips, but was checked by a glance at the group upon the floor where her husband was stretched out and two little urchins with sparkling eyes and glowing cheeks were climbing and tumbling over him as if they had found in this play the very essence of fun. She did say, I should like the good without the evil if I could have it. You have no evils to endure, said her husband. That is just all you know about it, you gentlemen. What would you think if you could not get an uninterrupted half hour to yourself from morning till night? I believe you would give up trying to do anything. There is no need of that. All you want is system. If you arranged your work systematically, you would find that you could command your time. Well, was the reply, all I wish is that you could just follow me around for one day, one day, and see what I have to do. If you could reduce it all to a system, I think you would show yourself a genius. When the lamp was trimmed, the conversation was resumed. Mr. James had employed the half hour in meditating on this subject. Wife, said he as she came in, I have a plan to propose to you and I wish you to promise me beforehand that you will accede to it. It is to be an experiment. I acknowledge, but I wish it to have a fair trial. Now, to please me, will you promise? Mrs. James hesitated. She felt almost sure that his plan would be quite impractical. For what does a man know of a woman's work? Yet, she promised. Now, 
I wish you, said he, to set apart two hours of every day for your own private use. Make a point of going to your room and locking yourself in. And also make up your mind to let work which is not done go undone if it must. Spend this time on just those things which will be most profitable to yourself. I shall bind you to your promise for one month. Then if it has proved a total failure, we will devise something else. When shall I begin? Tomorrow. The morrow came. Mrs. James had chosen the two hours before dinner as being on the whole, the most convenient and the least liable to interruption. They dined at one o'clock. She wished to finish her morning work, get dressed for the day, and enter her room at 11. Hardy as were her efforts to accomplish this, the hour of 11 found her with her work only half done. Yet, true to her promise, she left all, retired to her room, and locked the door. With some interest and hope, she immediately marked out a course of reading and study for these two precious hours. Then, arranging her table, her books, pen, and paper, she commenced a schedule of her work with much enthusiasm. But scarcely had she dipped her pen in ink when she heard the tramping of little feet along the hall and then a pounding at her door. Mama, I cannot find my mittens and Hannah is going to slide without me. Go to Amy, my dear. Mama is busy. So Amy busy too. She says she can't leave baby. Oh, the child began to cry, still standing close to the fastened door. Mrs. James knew the easiest and indeed the only way of settling the trouble was to go herself and hunt up the mittens. Then a parley must be held with Frank to induce him to wait for his sister, and the child's tears must be dried and little hearts must be all set right before the children went out to play. And so favorable an opportunity must not be suffered to slip without impressing on young minds the importance of having a place for everything and everything in its place. This all took time. And when Mrs. James returned to her study, her watch told her that half her portion had gone. Quietly resuming her work, she was endeavoring to mend her broken train of thought when heavier steps were heard in the hall and the fastened door was once more besieged. Now, Mr. James must be admitted. Mary, he said, cannot you come and sew a string on for me? I do believe there is not a bosom in my drawer in order and I am in a great hurry. I ought to have been downtown an hour ago. Well, the schedule was thrown aside, the work basket taken, and Mrs. James followed him. She soon sewed on the tape, but then a button needed fastening, and at last a rip in his glove was to be mended. As Mrs. James stitched away on the glove, a smile lurked in the corners of her mouth, which her husband observed. What are you laughing at? He asked to think how famously your plan works. I declare, said he, is this your study hour? I am sorry, but what can a man do? He cannot go downtown without a shirt bosom. Certainly not, said his wife quietly. When her liege lord was fairly equipped and off, Mrs. James returned to her room. A half an hour yet remained to her, and of this she determined to make the most. But scarcely had she resumed her pen when there was another disturbance in the entry. Amy had returned from walking out with the baby and she entered the nursery with him that she might get him to sleep. 
Now it happened that the only room in the house which Mrs. James could have her to herself with the fire was the one adjoining the nursery. She had become so accustomed to the ordinary noise of the children that it did not disturb her. But the very extraordinary noise, which Master Charlie sometimes felt called upon to make when he was fairly on his back in the cradle, did disturb the unity of her thoughts. The words which she was reading rose and fell with the screams and lulls of the child, and she felt obliged to close her book until the storm was over. When quiet was restored in the cradle, the children came in from sliding, crying with cold fingers, and just as she was going to them, the dinner bell rang. How did your plan work this morning? inquired Mr. James. Oh, famously, was the reply. I read about 70 pages of German and as many more in French. I am sure I did not hinder you long. Oh, no, you were only one of about a dozen interruptions. Oh, well, you must not get discouraged. Nothing succeeds well the first time. Persist in your arrangement, my dear, and by and by the family will learn that if they want anything of you, they must wait until after dinner. But what can a man do, replied the wife. He cannot go downtown without a shirt bosom. I was in a bad case, replied Mr. James. It may not happen again. I am anxious to have you try the month out faithfully and then we will see what shall come of it. The second day of trial was a stormy one. As the morning was dark, Bridget overslept, and consequently breakfast was too late by an hour. This lost hour, Mrs. James could not recover. When the clock struck 11, she seemed but to have commenced her morning's work. So much remained to be done. With mind disturbed and spirits depressed, she left her household matters in the suds as they were and punctually retired to her study. She soon found, however, that she could not fix her attention upon any intellectual pursuit. Neglected duties haunted her like ghosts around the guilty conscience. Perceiving that she was doing nothing with her books and not wishing to lose the morning wholly, she commenced writing a letter. Bridget, however, interrupted her before she had proceeded far on the first page. What shall we have for dinner, Mom? No market in it's come. Have some steaks, then. We ain't got none, then, ma'am. I will send out for some directly. Now there was no one to send but Amy, and Mrs. James knew it. With a sigh, she put down her letter and went into the nursery. Amy, Mrs. James has forgotten our marketing. I should like to have you run over to the provision store and order some beefsteaks. I will stay with the baby. Amy was not much pleased to be sent out on this errand. She remarked that she must change her dress first. Be as quick as possible, said Mrs. James for I am particularly engaged at this hour. Amy neither obeyed nor disobeyed, but managed to take her own time without any very deliberate intention to do so. Mrs. James, hoping to get along with the sentence or two, took her German book into the nursery, but this arrangement was not to master Charlie's mind a fig did he care about German, but the kitties he must have, whether or no, and kitties he would find in that particular book, so he turned its leaves over in great haste. Half of the time on the second day of trial had gone, when Amy returned and Mrs. James, with a sigh, left her nursery. Before one o'clock, she was twice called into the kitchen to superintend some important dinner arrangement. And thus it turned out that she did not finish one page of her letter. On the third morning, the sun shone and Mrs. James rose early 
made every provision she deemed necessary for dinner and for the comfort of her family. And then quite elated by her success and in good spirits and with good courage, she entered her study precisely at 11 o'clock and locked her door. Her books were opened and the challenge given to a hard German lesson. Scarcely had she made the first onset when the doorbell was heard to ring and soon Bridget coming nearer and nearer, then tapping at the door. Sam Paddy's wants to see you in the parlor, ma'am. Tell them I am engaged, Bridget. I told him, ma'am, you weren't to home and they sent up their card, but I just ain't got them just. There was no help for it. Mrs. James must go down to receive her callers. She had to smile when she felt little like it, to be sociable when her thoughts were busy with her task. Her friends made a long call. They had nothing else to do with their time. And when they went, others came. In very unsatisfactory chit chat, her morning slipped away. On the next day, Mr. James invited company to tea and her morning was devoted to preparing for it. She did not even enter her study. On the day following, a sick headache confined her to her bed. And on Saturday, the care of the baby devolved upon her as Amy had extra work to do. Thus passed the first week. True to her promise, Mrs. James patiently persevered for a month in her efforts to secure for herself this little fragment of her broken time, but with what success the first week's history can tell. With its close, closed the month of December. On the last day of the old year, she was so much occupied in her preparations for the morrow's festival that the last hour of the day was approaching before she made her good night's call in the nursery. She first went to the crib and looked at the baby. There he lay in his innocence and beauty, fast asleep. She softly stroked his golden hair and kissed gently his rosy cheek. And then carefully drawing the coverlet over it, tucked it in and stealing yet another kiss, she left him to his peaceful dreams and sat down on her daughter's bed. She also slept sweetly with her dolly hugged to her bosom. At this, her mother smiled, but soon grave thoughts entered her mind and these deepened into sad ones. She thought of her disappointment and the failure of her plans. To her, not only the past month but the whole past year seemed to have been one of fruitless effort, all broken and disjointed. Even her hours of religious duty had been encroached upon and disturbed. She had accomplished nothing that she could see, but to keep her house and family in order. And even this to her saddened mind seemed to have been but indifferently done. She was conscious of yearnings for a more, a more earnest life than this. Unsatisfied longings for something which she had not attained, often clouded what otherwise would have been a bright day to her. And yet the causes of these feelings seemed to lie in a dim and misty region, which her eye could not penetrate. What then did she need to see some results from her life's work? To know that a golden cord bound her life threads together into some unity of purpose, notwithstanding they seemed so often single and broken? She was quite sure that she felt no desire to shrink from duty, however humble, but she sighed for some comforting assurance of what just was duty. Her employments, conflicting as they did with her tastes, seemed to her frivolous and tasteless and useless. 
it seemed to her that there was some better way of living, which she from deficiency and energy of character or of principle had failed to discover. As she leaned over the child, her tears fell fast upon its young brow. Most earnestly did she wish that she could shield her child from the disappointments and mistakes and self-reproach from which the mother was then suffering. That the little one might take up life where she could give it to her, all mended by her own experience. It would have been a comfort to have felt indeed that in fighting the battle, she had fought for both. Yet she knew that it could not be so, that for ourselves, we must all learn what are those things which make for our own peace. The tears were in her eyes as she gave the good night to her sleeping daughter. Then with soft steps, she entered an adjoining room and there, fairly kissed out the old ear on another chubby cheek, which nestled among the pillows. At length, she sought her own rest. Soon though, she found herself in a singular place. She was traversing a vast plain. No trees were visible, save those which skirted the distant horizon and on their broad tops rested wreaths of golden clouds. Before her was a female who was journeying toward that region of light. Little children were about her, now in her arms, now running by her side. And as they traveled, she occupied herself in caring for them. She taught them how to place their little feet she gave them timely warnings of the pitfalls. She gently lifted them over the stumbling blocks. When they were weary, she soothed them by singing of this brighter land, which she kept ever in view and towards which she seemed hastening with her little flock. But what was most remarkable was that unknown to her, she was constantly watched by two angels who reposed on two golden clouds which floated above her. Before each was a golden book and a pen made of gold. One angel with mild and loving eyes peered constantly over her right shoulder. Another kept a strict watch over her left. Not a deed, not a word, not a look, escaped their notice. When a good deed, word, or look went from her, the angel over the right shoulder with a glad smile wrote it down in his book. When an evil, however trivial, the angel over the left shoulder recorded it in his book. Then with sorrowful eyes followed the pilgrim until he observed penitence for the wrong, upon which he dropped a tear on the record and blotted it out, and both angels rejoiced. To the looker on, it seemed that the traveler did nothing which was worthy of such careful record. Sometimes she did but bathe the weary feet of her little children. Sometimes she did but patiently wait to lure a little truant who had turned his face away from the distant light. Sometimes she did but soothe an angry feeling or raise a drooping eyelid or kiss away a little grief. But the angel over the right shoulder wrote it down. Sometimes her eyes were fixed so intently on that golden horizon and she became so eager to make progress thither that the little ones missing her care did languish or stray. Then it was that the angel over the left shoulder lifted his golden pen and made the entry and followed her with sorrowful eyes until he could blot it out. Sometimes she seemed to advance rapidly, but in her haste, the little ones had fallen back and it was the sorrowing angel who recorded her progress. Sometimes so intent was she 
to gird up her loins and have her lamp trimmed and burning, that the little children wandered away into quite forbidding paths. And it was the angel over the left shoulder who recorded her diligence. Now, the observer, as she looked, felt that this was a faithful and true record and was to be kept to that journey's end. Her sympathies were warmly enlisted for the gentle traveler, and with a beating heart, she quickened her steps that she might overtake her. She wished to tell her of the angels keeping watch above her, for her life's work were all written down, every item of it, and the results would be known when those golden books should be unclasped. She wished to beg of her to think of no duty trivial, which must be done, for over her right shoulder and over her left were recording angels who would surely take note of all. Eager to warn the traveler of what she had seen, she touched her. The traveler turned and she recognized herself. Startled and alarmed, she awoke in tears. The gray light of morning struggled through the half-open shutter. The door was ajar, and merry faces rushed in. Happy New Year, Mama. Wish you a happy new year, a happy new year. She returned the merry greeting most heartily. It seemed to her then as if she had entered into a new existence. She had found her way through the thicket in which she had been entangled, and a light was now about her path. The angel over the right shoulder whom she had seen in her dream would bind up in his golden book her life's work, if it were well done. He required of her no great deeds, but faithfulness and patience to the end of the race which was set before her. Now she could see plainly enough that though it was right and important for her to cultivate her own mind and heart, it was equally right and important to meet and perform faithfully all those little household cares and duties on which the comfort and virtue of her family depended. For into these little things, the angels carefully looked and these duties and cares acquired a dignity from the strokes of that golden pen. They could not be neglected without danger. Sad thoughts and sadder misgivings, undefined yearnings and ungratified longings seemed to have taken their flight with the old year, and it was with fresh resolution and cheerful hope and a happy heart she welcomed the glad new year. The angel over the right shoulder would go with her, and if she were found faithful, would strengthen and comfort her to its close. I hope you enjoyed that story. There is so much to think about within it. And I do hope that you write down your comments and questions while you still have the story fresh in your mind. And please bring them with you on April 8th at 6 p.m. when we will meet you for a virtual discussion and Q&A with Elaine Showalter. Please register for this free event on our website. Next week, we will continue our series Women Who Dare, 19th Century American Women Writers, with a story by Catherine Maria Sedgwick. Thank you for joining me today, and until next time.